Welcome. If you're new to pottery or just never thrown on the pottery wheel and you want to get started, or maybe you started but it's difficult for you to, to manage that damn clay on the wheel, then this video will be right for you. It's sort of a beginner's guide to um, drawing on the potter's wheel. And I know there's a lot of similar guides out there, but I hope I can still you know, help you a little bit and get you started. I'll take you through everything from uh, the kinds of wheel you can throw on, what clay is likely to be easiest for you to start off with, and um, how to wedge and center and expand and throw your first pots. So I hope this will be helpful and um, let's get started. There are two things you need to throw on the part of the wheel. A wheel, <laughs> of course, and clay. On top of that, you may want to use a couple of tools, uh, but it's not necessary. Uh, and the tools that you need are very simple. Most pottery stores will have these simple um, start packages that you can, you can pick up, or you can make your own uh, tools. I'll show you which ones uh, that I like to use. So let's look at the wheel first. There are basically two kinds of pottery wheel that, uh, that you can use. There's uh, the electric one. This is one I have, it's a shimpo wheel. I really like that. It's a strong and good uh, electric wheel. And you can use manual wheels, so-called kick wheels, because you typically kick the wheel around with your foot. Um, that's been the traditional way of throwing on a wheel. And that's how I was taught many years ago. <laughs> when I was in school, we only had manual wheels. It was actually quite good. The good thing about the manual wheels is that you can pick them up really cheap. They are often used in uh, schools, um, and sometimes you can even get one for free. You can also get more expensive ones. Um, a very good potter, um, like Simon Leach, he's uh, creating this tradition of, of kick wheels that uh, I think his grandfather started. They're very, very nice. They're also quite expensive, but they are nice, and some potters prefer that. Anyway, when you're picking the electric wheel, um, I, as I said, I like the Shimples. Uh, but there are other brands. Road is also making some. I know you guys in America have other brands that, that are also good. You need a strong wheel. Uh, some of them label how many kilos you can throw on them. And you may be surprised to see some of them say up to 45 kilo, and you're like, I'm never going to throw 45 <laughs> kilo. But, but keep in mind that uh, even if you throw a lot less than that, the wheel needs to be strong enough to sustain that power when, you, when you're centering the clay. So even if, you, if you're only uh, 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 planning to, to throw a couple of kilos, you still need a wheel that can take much more than that. And trust me, once you start working on, on the wheel, you most likely, <laughs> like me and many others, want to throw bigger and bigger, and uh, then you need a strong wheel. And again, stupid to buy a wheel and then throw it out and buy another one. There are a lot of very cheap wheels you can get on, uh, on Alibaba and Amazon, and places like that, typically from China. I haven't had any personal experience with them, but most often I would say they're not strong enough. They're not built to last. Uh, I would definitely go with one of the uh, good quality brand wheels uh, instead. But again, it depends, of course, on what financial um, capabilities you have. Um, but buy the best quality you can. As usual, you know, uh, the more you pay, the better the quality. So um, try and go with the good quality. Next to my wheel, I have two buckets. One of them is with water, and I have a couple of sponges. Um, I like different sizes. And I have this uh, sponge on a stick. It's nice when you have a, a high pot and you want to take out the water inside. I also have a little piece of, it could be um, uh, leather or plastic or a little bit of, uh, I don't even know what that is, but we'll go back to that. As you see, this uh, wheel has these sort of pins on the side. And I use that because I like to throw on bats. So um, let me just show you. This is a bat. I actually made this myself. I cut, just cut it out in a Plymouth. Uh, you can also buy commercial bats. Make sure that they fit whatever wheel you're working on. These bats fit onto the pins like this. And uh, it just makes it easier 
when you remove your pot because you can just take off the bath and put it on yourself to dry. You don't necessarily have to do this. And if you have a wheel without pins, you can still use bats. In that case, you throw a layer of clay, a flat layer of clay, and you put the bat on top of that. That sort of glues it to, um, to the, to the, to the uh, wheel head. So this is what I'm going to use. Um, but if you don't have that, and if you don't want to put the layer of clay or deal with bats, you can still also just throw on the wheel head. In that case, there's a little bit of challenge removing your, your pot, but um, that's something we may cover in a different video. The second thing you need is clay, of course. <laughs> and uh, there are many different kinds of clay and they have different capabilities. Some are made for throwing, some are made for sculpting. Uh, and um, there are basically three categories of clay, earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain. Of course, within these categories, there's lots of different kinds of uh, variations. Earthenware is low fired, so it doesn't go up to the same temperatures as stoneware and porcelain. So it's not as strong as uh, stoneware and porcelain is. But it's cheap. It's cheap to buy and it's cheap to fire because you don't fire to so high temperatures. And well, in these times with the energy crisis and such, lots of people choose that. And earthenware can be really, really beautiful. And because it's so cheap to buy, lots of schools are using earthenware. And uh, so it, it's a good place to start and it's relatively easy to throw in. Stoneware is probably the most common uh, clay type to throw in. That's what I use most. Um, you can get uh, all kinds of different stoneware. Uh, you can get like buff uh, colored uh, whitish stoneware. Uh, I use a lot of red stoneware and that's what the one we're going to use today with a lot of iron in it. It turns out really beautiful with, um, with the glazes I'm using. You can get stoneware with or without grog. Grog is these little pieces of pre-burned uh, ceramics and it helps um, the clay um, deal with thermal shocks. So typically you use a lot of grog if you're going to do uh, raku or pit fire, um, you know, traditional ways of firing where the thermal shock during the fire is more traumatic than when you use an electric computerized uh, uh, kiln. So, but, but on the other hand, <laughs> the more grog you have in it, uh, the more stony it feels and get, it can be really, really hard on your hands. It can turn almost bleedy. So I suggest that you, if you go with stoneware, you take a stoneware with no more than 20-25% grog and go for small pieces of grog because then it feels more smooth and it doesn't hurt your hands as much. Porcelain can be really, really nice. Porcelain is the strongest kind of clay. It is also fired to the highest temperature. That's why it's used for, for kitchenware. And you can throw it very, very thin. If you throw it thin enough and it's the right kind of porcelain, it can turn almost translucent. So you can actually look through it if you have light. It's very, very beautiful. But porcelain is also much more difficult to throw than earthenware and stoneware. So definitely suggest that you start out with stoneware or earthenware. And if you need to practice a lot and you don't have too much money, buy some cheap earthenware and start playing around with that. Unless you make really, really big things, and I'm guessing you don't start there. <laughs> um, earthenware is fine. It's only when you do bigger things that um, uh, the more stable uh, clay you get from, from the grog can be, can be useful. Don't bother with that to begin with. To begin with, you need the basic uh, skills of throwing. I'm going to be using a stoneware today from George and Schneider in Germany. It's something I can get locally and it's, it's relatively cheap. It's a uh, sort of high grog stoneware, it's got 40%, so it goes against a little bit what I just said before, but it's very, very fine grog, 0.2% um, size, so very, very small. So it doesn't feel groggy and it doesn't hurt my hands too much. But I can use it uh, in both uh, electric firing, I can use it in pit fire that I do a lot, and I can even use it in Raku. Um, and it's a uh, high iron clay, so it's got this beautiful orange brownish color that I really like a lot, and it looks good with my, uh, my glazes. But whatever uh, clay you choose, the methods that I'm going to show here is basically the same. The first few times you're going to um, practice throwing, uh, you should not take too much clay. Uh, on the other hand, don't use too little. Sometimes uh, when I do these uh, small uh, cups in porcelain, I'm throwing with just maybe 100 grams or even less. 
and it's very, very difficult. <laughs> so don't do that. Um, this is uh, about 900 grams. This is always a good idea to weigh your clay because then you can repeat the same size over and over again. 900 grams is good for like a medium sized uh, bowl, which is what we're going to do today. The first step is to wet your clay. Uh, some potters will tell you, you always have to wet your clay. <laughs> it's not entirely true because it depends on the clay type and um, where you get your clay from. George and Schneider, they actually compress uh, the clay really, really well. So the particles are aligned and there's no air bubbles. So you could actually just take it out of the bag and throw it on the wheel and use it. However, it doesn't hurt to wet it. And in this case, I put it together by a couple of small pieces and you definitely need to wet that because this can trap air. You know, if we just close it like that and put it on the wheel, there might be some air in here. And those air bubbles is gonna make uh, it difficult to, to make thin and even walls on your pot. And also they may, you know, you know, change a wall or explode in the kiln. So you don't wanna wedge it. To wedge your clay, um, usually start out by um, just slapping it a little bit. If you don't have a wedging table, you can do like I do here. This is just a stone. This is for, for paveway, I guess it's called. Um, very, very cheap. I think a, a few dollars uh, in a builder store. And it works really good. Um, slap it a little bit. That kind of wakens up the clay. It becomes a little bit softer that way. And then you start wedging. There are many ways to wedge. Uh, this is a very simple way of doing it. Put it up like this, pushing it down, pushing it down. That way, the clay sort of travel around um, and it accomplishes two things. First of all, you kind of squeeze out any air holes, air, air uh, pockets in the clay, which is very important. But also, you sort of align the particles in the clay. Clay consists of all these little uh, particles and uh, they're sort of like a chaotic uh, condition, uh, typically in the clay. When you wedge it, you align those particles and it does become easier when you're throwing. Um, so that's a good thing. When it starts feeling uh, like consistent and, and, and soft and, and nice, like a, almost like a, like a dough, <laughs> um, it's almost ready to throw. The last thing you want to do is make sure that you um, Slap it a little bit around and make sure that you have an even round surface. I also like to just roll it around a little bit and then you end up with this um, sort of like pyramid shaped cone with a very smooth surface. That way when you slam it onto your wheel uh, you won't trap any air. It will kind of like expand whoop, like that and um, you make sure that you don't track any air at the bottom or any inconsistency, so you get a nice clean button on your on your final pot. So let's move to the wheel. Uh, if you don't have bats, you can still throw, it's no problem, but then you need to practice to remove your, your items. It can be a little bit tricky without warping it, but you learn. Basically, you just make sure your hands are very dry, that you cut off the, the pot, and then you take with your fingers under the pot on the lower side where the, where the wall is strongest, and lift it off and place it on, um, on a wear board for trying. But I'm using bats. Um, I find it very convenient. So the first thing I always do is uh, damp it. Uh, I don't want to throw a lot of water on it. I just want to make sure that it's uh, sort of damped. It helps uh, the clay kind of uh, stick to the, to the bed, which you definitely want. Let me just get the clay. And here we have the clay ball we just made. You want to slap it onto the bed uh, pretty hard. You want it to, to attach itself uh, well. So uh, try and hit the center, then give it a few um, hits so, so it kind of sticks. The first thing you'll notice when you start throwing is that if it's not sticking well enough, it's gonna <laughs> jump around. So before we uh, start throwing, I just want to go through uh, the main um, the main uh, steps of throwing. There are four steps to throwing any kind of pot. First, you need to center it, then you need to open it, then you need to pull, and then you need to shape. So that's the four steps we're going through. So centering, 
opening, pulling, and shaping. The most difficult part, I think for most, is the centering. Because if, as you see now, the part or the clay ball is not in the center. It's moving around a little bit. And before you can actually start pulling and shaping, it needs to be perfectly centered. So a good thing here is to tap, slap it and tap it sort of like into place. Now you see it's actually more centered now. It's still not completely centered, far from enough to actually throw. So now we need to have some water on it because you want, you want the, the, the connection between your hand and the clay to be as frictionless as possible. The first thing I do is I kind of seal the button. So just put your finger down here and sort of seal it. That way you secure that there's no water that can come in under the clay. Because if that happens, then the clay falls off <laughs> and you don't want that to happen. Now we need it to be completely centered before we start doing anything else. And this is probably the part that most people struggle with. There are many ways that you can do this. I just found whatever works for me. Um, but basically it's important that you have good support in your elbows. So, because you want to control it. I mean, if you just do like this, then your hands is going to move around with the clay and you're never going to get it centered. You need to have your, your elbows and your arms fixed. You need to take control. So basically what I do is I have one hand, my right hand, I'm right-handed, and I turn the wheel uh, anti-clockwise. If you're left-handed, you need to do the opposite, of course. Um, I use this hand as a support, and I use this hand to push it down into my hand. And that way we can, we can, um, we can center the clay. So you see, already by doing that, it's almost centered. It's not completely centered, it's still warping a little bit down here. So you still need to work on that. So now, theoretically, it's centered. But you still want to, want to, want to do um, things to align the particles a little better. The next thing we do is something called coning up and coning down. And by pushing down to the sides here, I push up the cone. I know it looks sort of sexy. It is. <laughs> that way you help centering, but you also help align the particles as we also did in the wedging. Then you push it down. I used to forward this a little bit and push it down. The challenge of doing this is that if you press too high, I can just try and do it here. If you press too high, you're going to end up with a pyramid. So there's, a, there's a, a hole in here. And then when you press down, that hole can end up trapping air. So you, you want to avoid that. So let's try and, and get that out of the way. So if you push lower and you push it up through your hands, you're not going to get that um, uh, volcano hole up there. The other problem is, if you just push it down, let's just try that. You're going to end up, well, I didn't do it as bad as I wanted, but you're going to end up with sort of a mushroom shape. And the same thing can happen. If this falls down here, you can trap air in here, and you definitely don't want that. So that's the two main issues with coning up and coning down. Avoid creating a volcano and avoid creating a mushroom. This alone takes a little bit of practice. Do it over and over again. I mean, with most of the, the wheel throwing uh, things you're going to learn today, it's sort of like riding a bike. It takes time, it takes practice, and on the way it feels like you're never going to be able to ride that bike. But I promise you, you will. I mean, it doesn't require any extreme skills to learn how to throw, but it does require practice. I usually cone up and down a couple of times, um, maybe, um, I usually do it maybe two, three times. That should be enough. So, now you see that the clay ball is um, completely centered, it's spinning around evenly. Now it's time to open up the ball. 
And opening up the ball is um, done in many ways. Um, some potters like to use a finger, some potters like to use the whole hand. I like to use my thumbs. I think I have better control. So I put my hands on each side, uh, which helps me not to, to push the, the, the clay around. Place my thumbs in the middle and press it down. Do it very slowly, very easily. Make sure that it's, um, you have enough water so your fingers don't suddenly stick. If you need more water, just add it. And at this stage, there's something that you need to learn. You need to go slow. Uh, not so much the spinning of the wheel, but with your movement. You have to attack the clay slowly and you have to release your hand slowly. If you, if you do it like this, then it starts wobbling around. <laughs> I think you can fix that. Um, I was, I was over-exaggerating a little bit. <laughs> but you get the point. You need to release your hands very slowly and attack the clay very slowly. And like anything else you practice in the beginning, you should sort of overdo it. Do it very, very slowly. Attack it very, very slowly. Um, once you get more experience, it's sort of like it's in your hands. Again, it's sort of like riding the bike. Now we opened up um, the clay. Um, and um, the next question is, how deep does it have to be? How deep do you need to go down? Well, that depends a little bit. It depends on what you're doing and how you're going to end up. Um, as I said, this is, uh, we're going to do a bowl this time. And um, you, can, you can design bowls in different ways. I like for this bowl uh, to have a small uh, foot, which we're going to do later, tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to trim it. I'm going to trip this uh, nice little foot with a foot ring. And to do that, we need a certain thickness. So I'm going to aim for something like about a centimeter. So the question is, how do you measure the thickness of your clay? To do that, I use a potter's wheel. And this is something that you find in all starter's packages. If you, if you go to your local potter's store or go to Amazon or something, buy like a starter pack for wheel throwing, this is going to be included. This is just a thin needle. You can use that to check how thick it is. You basically just put it down. Put your finger where the clay starts, take it up, and then you can see how thick it is. This is a little bit too thick for my taste, so I'm, I'm going to make it a little bit thinner. So I do that by putting my hands in the middle, and slowly moving them to the side. Now is also the time to decide what kind of shape you're going to do. Because if you do a bowl, you want a round button inside. If you do a cup, you probably want a more square. Same thing if you do a vase or a pitcher or something, you want a more square button. But for this, it's a bowl, so we want a nice, even, uh, continuous um, shape. So we're just going to shake again. And yeah, now it looks good. It's sufficient for my, um, for my foot rim that I want to throw. The last thing you do before you start uh, the next phase with the, with the pulling is to compress the bottom. You don't need to press so much, but um, we do want the clay at the bottom to be well compressed. That will help avoid uh, any, any kind of cracking, especially the, 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 the field is cracking at the bottom. So you're going to do it like this. Just let your fingers go over a few times like this. Okay, so now we centered and we opened. That's the first two steps. The third step is pulling. And pulling is the art of moving clay from down here and from this low uh, uh, height to a higher uh, height. When you, do, um, when you do pots on the wheel, almost no matter what kind of shape you're doing, if it's a bowl or a vase or a cup or even a teapot, you start out by making a cylinder. So that's sort of like a straight pot. The reason for this is that because it's turning around, the clay wants to move out. And it's much easier to move it out than it is to move it back in. It is possible, but it's more difficult. So you usually start out with a cylinder, and then depending on what you want to do, if it's a cup, you just leave it as a cylinder, or a vase maybe you do. If it's a bowl, then you start expanding it. 
and shaping it. Maybe you, if you want to make a vase with a bulby a bottom, uh, you then start to expand part of it. So we want to try and keep the clay in a, in a sort of like a pyramid shape because we want to make sure that it doesn't suddenly move out and we can't get it back in. So we, we want to push it in and 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 um, and pull it in a in a yeah sort of like a pyramid or a cone shape. So now that we opened it up and um, sort of made it nice inside here, I'm just gonna push it slightly in so it don't um, don't um, go crazy on us. And another thing is. Whenever you, you let go of the clay, just compress the rim, make sure that it's still centered and that there's no inconsistencies, so it's not bubbling around and there's not the same thickness all the way around. That's gonna help you. Uh, the more um, you practice this and the more precise it is on this part, the better it will be because even small inconsistencies at in this stage will become bigger and bigger when you move out and then suddenly it's just moving all around. So. So now we have the beginning of our pyramid shape. We haven't started pulling yet. Pulling is, as I said, the art of pushing this clay up against the, the clay ball into a thinner wall. Some people like to use their finger, maybe a couple of fingers. Some use their knuckle. Some people uh, turn their hands around and use uh, the thumbs. Uh, some people use a sponge. Uh, it can help make sure that um, that that the clay stays wet. But the problem with the sponge is you don't get a feel for the clay. So I, I would suggest that you try and practice with your, with your, with your fingers or your knuckle. You can, you can keep your sponge in your hand um, to, to make sure that the, that the clay stays wet or you can just drip a little bit of, of water on the clay. Because you wanna make sure that it's, it's wet all the way around because if there's some dry areas, then when, you, when your fingers hit that, it's gonna, gonna pull the clay and then of course it's all gonna wobble around. I like to use a um, combination of my fingers and my knuckles. So you're gonna push in here and you're gonna have a position where the outer hand is lower than the upper hand because you basically wanna, wanna create this, um, this uh, uh, bulb of, um, of clay that you move up through the pot. So we move in at the bottom and then we move up. You do it slowly, let the, uh, the clay guide you and don't push too much at one time. And again, compress the rim, make sure that it's still even and this looks good. And if it starts to move out, then just give it a light pressure here and you can keep it in. We're going to do another pull, depending on the kind of clay. Um, if it's porcelain, you only have maybe two, maybe three pulls. After that, you won't be able to pull anymore. It'll just get weaker and weaker. With stoneware, earthenware, you can pull a few more times. But it's a good idea to practice and try and um, see if you can if you can pull it to the height that you need within um, within. Uh, um, a, a, a couple of pulls, maybe three pulls. So go for something, two or three pulls. So again, I've now pushed in at the bottom. Need a little more water here. It dried out when I was talking. <laughs> um, and then we push it. Now, because we are doing a bowl, we don't want the rim to be too thin because when we expand this, of course, it's naturally going to be thinner and thinner. So if it's too thin now, it's going to break when we, when we, um, when we pull it uh, apart. Another thing at this stage is that, and you can, you can try and, and, and sometimes I like to put my fingers like that and make sure that the wall is even. Um, if, if there's suddenly something that is much thicker or much thinner, uh, then it's going to weaken the wall. So um, take down your hand, move it through, make sure that, um, that it's, um, 
as even as possible. We're still going to have a little bit left here. I could probably move up a little more clay, but you also want to have at least some clay down here to secure stability. You can always move some of that in the last stage with the trimming that we're going to do um, tomorrow. So now we completed the first three simple steps. We sent it, we opened, and we pulled. Now we need to shape we need to expand the clay. In this case, it's not going to be a cup or, or base, it's going to be a bowl. So now we need to start moving it out. And at this stage, you probably want to lower the speed just a little bit, because again, because it's turning around, if it's very fast, it's going to be like thrown out and you won't be able to control it. So always adjust your speed to what you're doing. So we go down with the hand. And we're slowly going to expand. And again, release your hands very slowly, like this. You see now, it's still circular, <laughs> sort of. And now I can actually see that I have, and this is a good example, I actually didn't wedge it good enough, so there's a small air bubble. And you can feel it when, when, you, when you turn around, it, it kind of, there's a bubble. It could also be uh, like a dry piece of, of clay, but this is, this is a new clay, so no, it's not. So when you get to that point, whoop, that is, then you can use your needle tool and just poke a hole in the bubble, fix it. The earlier you do this, the better result you're going to get. And now we're just going to make sure that it's still centered. So we're going to keep expanding. And um, as we want this uh, nice um, button, with the continuous uh, rounded um, flow, I'm going to use my, my fingers again. You could be using um, a tool even on this stage. If you are going to use a tool, one of the most common ones is a rib. You can get all kinds of ribs. There's a, um, this is like a plastic rib. This is plastic too. You can get, uh, well, I don't have it here, like wooden ribs. I like these plastic ones. This is from, from Mud Tools. Um, this is sort of flexible. Um, and they have like a nice continuous curve here that you can use to, to make sure that you get this nice curve on the inside too. So um, use this, and um, in um, in the top of your ball, be careful because it's very sensitive up here. Don't push too hard. The deeper you get down, the more clay you have, the more heavy you can you can push. And this is the slip, the, the watered down clay that sits on the surface. Just remove that. Also, because we keep putting water on it, you need to take out the water in, in the middle of your bowl. Uh, first of all, right now you need to do it because you want to, um, to see the shape of the bowl. And uh, also by the end, when you, when you finish your bowl, uh, you want, don't want to leave any water down there because if there's water down there, it won't dry. So the rest of the bowl will dry, but not there, and then it will, you know, distort or crack, worst case. Still want to make sure that the clay is wet when you work on it. Another uh, rib that I like to use a lot is this very simple plastic rib I got from a local supplier. It's just a piece of plastic, really. It's just nice to, um, to kind of manage um, the shape. Your main focus when you're throwing a ball is the inside because it's much more difficult to trim the inside. Some parts will tell you never to trim the inside of a ball. Well, like everything else, you can do whatever you want, but it's much easier to, to finish the inside when you're throwing and then just trimming the outside. So again, I'm just going to use my rib here to make sure that we have a nice continuous flow. 
inside. So now you have to decide on your final form. I mean, this is a nice form. I would like it to be a little bit wider, but now of course it gets tricky because we are on the thin side of the walls. So um, I'm gonna use my rim and I'm gonna uh, use a sponge in my hand on the outside. And I'm gonna expand this a little bit. And again, just compress the rim a little bit, just to make sure that it's um, even. And again, I'm going to remove the slip from the inside and the water. And here we go. That's a ball. So now the last step is to remove it. In this case, I'm just going to take it off the bed. If you, if you don't have a bed, um, you probably want to, um, to cut it now. You can use a wire like this. This is a commercial wire. You can also make your own wires. Um, put it down here. Important thing is to hold it down with your fingers because you don't want it to like move around and, and create <laughs> like something like this. Um, you want it to be a, a, a clean cut. I will do this now, even though I have it on the bed because we want to turn it around because, before it's too dry to trim the bottom. So I'm just going to do this now. That way, now it's, it's free. You could move it around now. I'm not going to do that because I don't need to. Um, and then we're going to leave it to dry for tomorrow. And then um, we'll trim it. After your pot, in this case, bowls have dried to a sort of a leather hard stage, which is like not wet and not completely dry, like, like dusty dry. But like you can still do something to it. If you, if you try and wriggle, it won't move. But if you, um, if you try and scratch in it, you can scratch like uh, pieces of sort of semi-dry clay off. When you get to that stage, and it's a matter of experience uh, when exactly you do that, it's very important that you do it at the right stage. Then you have the option to trim. And that is, you can, you can uh, scrape off basically some of the clay on your pot and you can add some textures or you can trim the button. You can trim the foot uh, ring uh, if you like that. It's optional. It's not something you have to do, but typically you would do it with um, with parts where you want this uh, special foot ring, or if you, if they're too thick, uh, the walls, and you want to make it a little bit lighter, uh, or if you want to add some decorative features like like uh, chattering marks or or or, 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 or uh, what do you call facet <laughs> cottage. Um, but again, it's an option. But we're going to do it here uh, today, and I'll show you uh, how I do this. It typically takes somewhere between a day, two days to, to dry. Funny enough, it's winter, so it's cold. Even inside the house, it's not super warm, but it's also very dry. So it dried a little quicker than I expected. These were actually made this morning, and now it's close to midnight. And they're actually a little bit too dry. If you look inside this bowl, um, I actually managed to make it really nice. So I'm not going to do any trimming inside. You can if you want, but it's kind of tricky because when you trim, it's going to fall down. And if it's too wet, it's going to stick. If you do inside trimming, don't try and remove these little pieces. Just let it be until it's completely dry. Then they're easy to remove. Otherwise, you're going to get bumps and, yeah, well, inconsistencies that just look good. So let's put it back um, on the wheel. If you're using um, bats like I do, it's easy to put it back. But be aware that it may have to turn 180 degrees because they may not be completely um, synchronized, the two holes, especially if you made them myself. But this one looks okay. 
contrary to what most potters do, I actually start the trimming um, when I uh, have it on the bed. Because that way I can still feel the inside uh, to see how thick it is. This bowl is actually pretty good, so I don't want to take off too much. In terms of tools, you can use like these very simple um, uh, trimming uh, tools. Um, you can get them in any, any pottery store. They're quite cheap. I like this uh, Japanese style um, tool. It's from uh, Mod Tools. Um, it's not super expensive, but it's really nice because you can use the different angles. And there's another one in the back that I also use. But I mean, there's a million different kinds of, of trimming tools. I have, I have different ones um, that I use <laughs> in different ways. I like this one a lot. I like these normal ones and also like this small one for the foot. We'll get back to that in a minute. But I'll start with this uh, Japanese one. And I'm just gonna lightly trim it uh, because as I said, this is already um, have a sort of a uh, good size of the walls. You have to be careful when you do this trimming because you can very easily push it out of um, position. As you saw, I already did that a little bit. Um, and that way, of course, it will start wobbling. But you know what? When you do handmade pottery, it's always going to end up wobbling a little bit. And there's a very experienced potter told me once, you can see it, it's not bad, but it, it, it shakes a little bit. Very experienced uh, potter once told me the way to stop wobbling. You know what that is? Stop the wheel. <laughs> of course, it's a bit of a joke. But the fact is, you only see it when it moves around, unless it's really, really, you know, skewed in a very bad way. So, so don't, don't be too stressed about that. But by having the hand on the inside, be careful if you have little, little crumbs of clay, you don't push it into the, to the body. Now it's still beautiful inside. But by having my hand on the inside, I can sort of feel um, where, 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 where I could take off a little bit. And this piece here is a little bigger than the rest of it. So I want to remove a little bit here. And then you can also see how much you have down here uh, closer to the foot. And in this case, too, a little bit here. I don't want to take off any more of this. One thing you also may want to do is to use a, a shiny stone. You know, you, any, any stone will do. It just has to be super shiny and very, very you know, soft, sort of. Well, stones are not soft, but you know what I mean. And you can use it to sort of polish. Um, if you polish the rim, I mean, we already used uh, the, the chamois uh, of leather, but if you use this, it'll be so super smooth and, and just really nice, nice and soft. So now we're ready um, to do the bottom, and uh, we're gonna liberate it from the bat. We're gonna cut it off with the wire that I showed you in the beginning. And just gonna do, again, put it down with your fingers down, Turn it around, just half around. Now three. Now we can take it off like this. Be careful when you touch it because you can still you can still push it out of of shape. You're going to remove the bat and make sure that your your wheel head is clean when you turn it around. At least where you're going to place it. And now when you turn it around, be careful because if you slam it down on the wheel head, it can break very easily. Remember, this is just dry mud. It is very fragile. And also, if you hold it like this, you can, you can actually push it together. So ideally, if you can somehow grab onto the foot or just support it a little bit and turn it around very, very carefully, put it down. So now we need to send it before we can finish the bottom and the lower part of it. If I turn it around now, you can see it's actually almost centered. There's different ways you can center it. Uh, professional potters will tell you that you should tap center. That is, you tap it slowly and put it into position. I think it's really difficult. <laughs> I 
I haven't, I haven't practiced it enough. I should practice it. I know. But another way to do it is just to put your finger, and then you can see much, much easier uh, when it's when it's not when it's not um, correctly centered. In this case, it's here. So be careful when you do it. Move it a little bit. It's still not completely centered. Don't worry too much about this because this is this is a little bit fluffy. It's not going to be centered. So look at the the part just below it. And I think it's good now. So when you start to to trim it, it will move around unless you secure it. So we're going to do that with a couple of of, um, of fresh uh, lumps of clay. And we're going to use the same clay as we use when we throw this part because we we don't want it to take color of a different clay. So basically, I'm just going to make three pieces. I'm going to secure them to the bed. Now, when you do that, don't press into the pot. If you do that, you're going to break the wall. Instead, push down to the wheel head like this. So you create a little fence and hold on to the pot so it doesn't move around when you do it. I put my second piece. Three pieces will make sure that, it's, um, that it doesn't move. But make sure that it's secured good to the bed. Now it's stable. So, you see this top here is not completely centered. The rest of the pot is pretty good. So what I start doing is, I'm going to mark where I want my foot. And that takes a little bit of experience, because you want a foot that is narrow enough, that it looks elegant, but also you don't want it so narrow that you cut a hole when you, when you trim. And maybe that's <laughs> the right time to say that. When you start trimming, you it's very difficult to judge how much you can trim. If you don't trim enough, it's going to be too heavy and maybe look ugly. If you trim too much, you're going through and you're going to break it. And you should. <laughs> I'm not saying you should break all your parts, but unless you try and go through a part, unless you try and break it, you're not going to know when it's too much. So sooner or later, even I, even more professional partners than me, much more professional partners than me, do it now and then. But um, so first, I marked it so this circle that I made with my with my uh, potter's needle is completely circular. So I'll try and trim uh, into this uh, circle. And again, same way as when we were throwing, lean your elbows on your on your on your knees or something, or the or the splash pan. Make make sure that you control where you put it, not the clay. So now you see, now we cut into the clay to this uh, size of the rim, um, and it's circular. See, this is where I like to use the other end of it. It's very nice, because then we can make it flat on the top. And as I said, with this particular ball, it's actually a bowl, <laughs> it's actually not very thick, um, so be careful. You shouldn't press it in, you should like place it and then put it in how many millimeters <laughs> you want to take off, it's little by little, and so you don't push it in, you cut it out, and there's a big difference there. And uh, that's again, it's something that you need to, um, to, to just practice. It's um, something that has to be in your hands. Now we took off this little part here, so, so we have a continuous flow on the side. As I mentioned, I want to have a, um, a foot on this. Um, it's not something you have to do, but for some parts, it's nice. So to do that, I want to create like, like a, a, a part of it that is, uh, that is um, cut right into um, the size of the bone. This can be a little bit tricky depending on how wet the clay is. So this is a, it's always more wet in the foot than it is in the rest of the bowl. So I said in the beginning it was a little bit too wet, but down here on the foot it's actually, uh, it was too dry, but down here on the foot it's actually a little bit too wet. Now, of course, we get this funny looking uh, uh, or, or edge here. We don't want that. So I'm going to cut that off. And this is where it gets dangerous because we need to 
of course cut it off, but not so much that uh, we cut into the bowl and cut through it. And how much? Well, that's the tricky question. One thing you can do is if you tap it, you can sort of hear a change sound. When it becomes a more hollow sound, it's difficult to hear in the video, but when it becomes more hollow, it's thin. When it becomes more uh, high pitched, it's uh, thicker. So I'm going to take it like in small steps, but don't go too fast. Careful if it's if it's a little too wet. This is a little bit too wet. Then um, it will kind of crumple up. So you need to stop and remove um, those little crumples, and then um, and then you can adjust the curve here. Yeah, I should probably have waited another hour or two. But um, now we do it anyway. Mini potters will make a little indent here uh, to grab the, clay, uh, the glaze. If you want to glaze outside, then it's something that the glaze can hold on to and not run down. That, that can be a good trick. Um, the glazes that I use for these kind of pots don't run. Um, I know by experience. So I don't, I don't really need a glaze catcher um, for this to work. So now the side looks good. Now I want to create the, the, the rim. So I want to create like a circle and, and lower the middle part of it. This is probably, this is probably one of the most difficult um, parts of, of trimming a, a bowl or, or a cup for that matter. So first we want to make sure that it's flat and even. And at this stage, it's very important that this is circular because if it's not, the, the, the little uh, rim you get will, won't be even all the way around. So what I start out with, and this is very important, you hold on to this and don't let the pot control it, but control it by, by your position. I first mark the outside or the inside where, where I want the rim. And I push down just enough to sort of like make a, a mark for where I want it. Now you can see that it is very circular. I don't know if you can see, but I can, I can maybe show you here. Um, you can see it is actually very even uh, size all the way around. I'm just going to put the camera back here. Yeah. Now I can take the in part of, inner part of it. You could, of course, like use the whole side of it, but I, I choose normally to start out with the corner because the, the less you take, the less pressure you put. And again, it's important that you don't let the clay control you, but you decide how deep you want, and then you kind of hold it there and go through. And you actually have to hold on quite strong to your, to your trimming tool to do that. So now, of course, it looks ugly. Again, if you can maybe tip it over here, you can see. I wouldn't say it looks ugly, but there's all these little uh, swirls, and you probably don't want that. Maybe you do. I mean, there's no rules in pottery. You can do it whatever way you want. But after I take out like the first part with this very small trimming tool, I move to, um, typically I move to a bigger one. Let me just see where I have it. Um, something like this. Uh, because now <clears throat> we're going to take off the edges of this uh, swirly <laughs> thing. But again, don't push too much because if you push now, you will go through. Also, the thinner it gets, the more weak it is, and you can very easily push it down, and then you're going to have an inside that, bump, <laughs> that bumps up and that doesn't look good. So 
So here's very important not to push, but to put it in the position, take, uh, you're cutting out, you're not pressing out. Sometimes when this um, wet, I cheat a little bit, and um, some potters will say that's dangerous because it may um, cause the pot to um, to um, to crack up. I don't think so. In my experience, I use blow dryer, not to dry it completely, but just to dry it a little bit so it's easier to uh, trim. See, only that, not that much. So, um, so now we can easily uh, trim the inside without pushing it. So I just use my finger to sort of um, to sort of um, polish it a little bit, just to make it smooth. And um, again, you can tap it. And this is now super thin. Maybe I actually trimmed off a little bit too much. It's only a couple of millimeters now, um, but um, I think it survives. So now it's actually finished. I do want to uh, give this a little more heat. Um, and I'm going to show you in a second why. The last thing I want to do is I want to um, put my maker's mark on it. I have these beautiful ones that I got made in, um, in Ukraine. Um, I can put a link to a video I made about them, then stainless steel, so they last forever. Uh, some people put it on the rim, some people put it on the inside. I'm going to put it on the inside because the rim is not very tall, so it won't fit. Now, if you're going to do that, you've got to be careful because if you just push it here, you're going to get a bump on the inside <laughs> and that doesn't look so good. So now we're going to remove it. And again, it's the same thing. That's why I dried it here because now I can actually touch the rim be very careful when you move it around now. You don't want to distort it. And um, when I look at the inside now, it's probably difficult to see, but it actually bubbles up a little bit. So that means I actually did push uh, the button just a little bit. But that's easy to fix. So I'm going to put it here, and that's why I dried it, because I don't want this to be too wet. I'm just going to center it. It doesn't have to be perfectly centered, but um, I want it decent centered, like this. And then I will take this small, super flexible, very flexible um, rib, and I will just use it on the inside to just push it back in place. Not much pressure, just very, very light. So now it's perfect. Ah, a little bit more. So it's Difficult to see the difference on the video, but now I have this perfect continuous curve. It was completely dry and I dropped a marble ball here. It will just roll back and forward. So now we want to add that um, markers, maker's mark. And to do that, because I want to do it on the bottom, and you need to have your hand on the inside and, uh, and uh, be on the, on the other side of where you put it, to support it so you don't go through. So I'm just going to do it like this. And now this is dangerous. It's difficult to do it when I also have to do video. Now I have the small maker's mark at the bottom. Now I just want to take it back here because now 
even though I supported it, I got, you can almost see that little bulb, and it's not much. I can just push it back a little bit with my finger. And again, if I center this, I can use this flexible rim again and just make sure that it's completely smooth. I also use my thumb. And now it looks perfect. Now it's done, ready to dry. But before I let it dry completely, I just want to show you something. Remember when we when we were throwing these balls, we used a little less than a kilo. I think it was actually 900 grams for this one. I made a couple of different ones. And now, um, let's see how much it weights now. So this is after the initial trimming. I don't know if you can see it here. Let me see. It's only 587 grams. So just by drying and um, by trimming it, we actually lost a few hundred grams. That's a lot of water in this clay, I have to say that. So when it dries, it will even be lighter. I think it will probably end up about 400 grams. And 400 grams, that's a light ball in this size. And that's nice. It just feels nice that it's not too heavy. The shape is good and it's ready. I will try it and um, I will get back to you. Now the ball just have to dry completely before we can fire it. Bisque fire it. Now that's the first fire. That's where we turn clay, dry mud into ceramics. So it becomes hard. Now it's easy to handle. It's still it's a little fragile, fra fragile but um, at least we can handle it a little easier. And then we can glaze it, if you want to glaze it, of course. Or you can pit fire it or rock fire it or whatever is the next step for your, for your pot. But that's going to be subject for another video. So I hope you enjoyed it and I hope that you um, got a few tips for how to throw. I mean, I want to repeat this, but throwing is almost like learning how to bike. You can't read about it. You can't like study a manual and say, you know, if you if you tip this much, you have to move your butt these many millimeters to the other. I mean, it, it doesn't work. You have to learn your hands to do it. Brain, hand coordination. And there's only one way to do it. Practice and practice and practice. And the terrible thing with <laughs> wheel throwing is that there are all these steps. I talked about the four different steps. You have to center, you have to open, you have to pull, and you have to shape. And you have to master each of the steps to be able to make a finished pot. And in the beginning, you're struggling with centering. It won't be completely centered, and then you start pulling, and it goes completely crazy, and you end up with something you don't like too much. And then you start mastering your centering, and then you mess it up <laughs> when you pull. And then when you master centering and pulling, you're going to mess up the shaping. And then finally, you know, you have a really nice pot, and you trim it, and you destroy it. And then you can start all over again. <laughs> That's just how it is. But I think it's very rewarding and it's actually possible, I would say, for almost anyone to learn. So go ahead and try. If you have access to a community a workshop where they have wheels, use it. If you have a place at home, use it. It is really a lot of fun. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video and um, there will be another video next Sunday. So uh, please subscribe or comment, like, share, whatever you want. If you have some good tips, I didn't, I didn't have time to share, I forgot to share, please share them. If you hate it, you're welcome to say that too. We have almost freedom of speech here. So <laughs> I hope to see you uh, soon again. Have a great day.